Uh, hi, Erin um, in Miranda. Erin, uh, it's nice to see you in, the, in this virtual space. Uh, so you know it's also my first time doing these kinds of webinars, so <laughs> um, you'll have to bear with me. Also, because it's uh, recorded, basically I'm going to handle it in a way um, where we can imagine that the audience will actually most likely watch it as a recording uh, rather than being live like yourself. But as Phil said, uh, you're most welcome to interrupt, ask uh, by raising your hand, just um, interject or ask questions, or use the chat box to um, basically interact with some of the content that's being presented. Um, so my name is Cecile Doyen, and I'm an educator uh, at heart. I've been working with the PYP since 1998 in all kinds of capacities. Uh, most uh, recently, I was working with the academic development, the program development team in the academic division in the IB in The Hague in the PYP. Um, and now I'm actually supporting non I mean NGOs, non-governmental groups, um, uh, to um, to basically look at uh, programs, educational programs, uh, to support most vulnerable children. Uh, so this is a little bit of my journey in a very short nutshell. Um, but let's get to the actual um, overview of this webinar. Uh, basically, we're going to look at what transdisciplinary learning means in the PYP and how um, disciplinary learning can support and strengthen a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, these are very broad um, uh, questions and points. Uh, obviously, there are only two of you um, in, the, in the audience. But if you're watching this as a recording, uh, I would encourage you to actually watch this with colleagues so that you can actually at times pause this webinar and discuss this uh, with your colleagues as well. So some of the outcomes of this webinar is basically looking at um, our aim to explore uh, current understandings around transdisciplinarity. Uh, and I put it in, uh, in brackets because um, there's just different explanations around this particular term. And uh, we're also going to discuss how we can develop a non-polarizing view on transdisciplinary learning, disciplinary learning. And we're going to draw implications for the learner, learning community, and learning and teaching in the PYP. I, I wanted to start, actually, um, with basically connecting a little bit to your own experience of learning in general. And I'd, I'd like to ask you to actually think of a memorable learning moment for you and think of the one word or two words that can describe the nature of this particular memorable moment. Um, as you're watching the webinar now, uh, you can use the chat box to actually input these words. Uh, if you're watching the recording, you can actually pause now and have a discussion with your colleagues uh, on what constitutes for you a memorable learning moment. Or if you'd like to think about a memorable learning moment for your students that they've basically discussed with you, feel free to do that as well. So if you were to describe the nature of this memorable experience, what words would you use? So I see engaging, fun, useful from Erin. And Miranda has actually written uh, to me privately. It says real world. Uh, thanks, Miranda. Okay, real Thank world. You. Okay. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks, Erin. Um, interestingly, uh, when you look at these words, and obviously if we had 10 people in the virtual room today, we'd have a, a whole different set of words, I'm, I, I suppose. Um, it's interesting to discuss with people and also with students if their experiences and their memorable moments are actually rooted in particular discipline subjects or are they rooted in bigger, broader experience and how it actually makes a connection to their own motivation, their own understanding of the world, as Miranda was saying, um, basically making it memorable, long-lasting, and make learning sticking uh, for a long time in these children's lives or in your own. It's basically because it connects to your real world. The word engaging that Erin also shared also relates to that somehow. Um, we do have to recognize that, so this idea of long-lasting um, and uh, le learning experiences and also learning experiences that are not particularly rooted in subject-specific knowledge, um, it's not new in the PYP. This, this word of transdisciplinarity has been used um, since the beginning of PYP, but we do have to acknowledge that it's not an unusual word uh, that we use um, in our day-to-day -day conversation. 
Um, so something that we've done uh, with some uh, colleagues of mine in, in previous work uh, was to actually simply do an analysis. And I'm going to spend a little bit ti of time now doing a little bit of theoretical front loading, uh, if you don't mind. I know that uh, these webinars aim to look at our practice, and we will do that in a little bit. But um, I'm also keen to always hook our thinking into some uh, findings, some observations of what the literature and what theories are saying out there. Um, and it's been interesting to look at this uh, particular exercise that we've conducted, looking at a, an analysis of academic citations in different documents, uh, research reports, and so on. And this exercise actually looked and aimed at looking at transdisciplinary, the actual word transdisciplinary, used um, in the context of education. So used in conjunction with the word education. And as you can see, even when the PYP was created in 1997, uh, the incurrence of these two words being together in one document was very low. Um, and it's been on the rise since around 2005. So this is basically to observe, um, it actually made me think, um, this is interesting, so we're still basically trying to figure out how this transdisciplinary construct relates to uh, education. And there's not a whole lot that's been done. So I think it's important for us at the start of this webinar to just acknowledge that we are all in our own individual and maybe in our collective with our colleagues, we're all um, trying to grapple with this particular notion of transdisciplinary tea, that it's quite new. Um, and it's still new for some, uh, for some people, especially if you're starting with a, with a PYP yourself. I wanted to bring also um, another uh, piece of literature, and I'm sorry, but you probably cannot see the actual reference very well, but you can basically Google it to find the full report. It's basically a report that was written by the Institute for the Future um, from the University of Phoenix Research Institute. And basically, they published a report on the development of skills for today's students in order to prepare them for tomorrow's unknown. Now, I, I want to make it clear that I'm not a big proponent of looking at students as only the future workers. Um, but it is a reality that we have to grapple with. And what's interesting about this report is that they actually list six drivers for future work skills. Um, and by drivers, what they mean is disruptive shifts that will reshape the workforce landscape. And in that, for example, one of the drivers is the fact that we're going to be increasingly uh, evolving in a globally connected world. Um, we, we're going to be looking at um, the rise of smart machines and systems and so on. So these six drivers basically are also associated with 10 key skills that are needed in the future workforce. And what's very interesting here is that what do you see appearing between the fact that we're dealing with an increasingly computational world and extreme longevity of, um, of, of changes and increasing pace in, in changes is transdisciplinarity. So they're looking at unpacking this skill of transdisciplinarity. And I'm going to uh, read up, um, oh, I see that Miranda has actually posted the link. Thank you, Miranda, for that. Very helpful. Um, and um, I'm going to read up just a quote. Obviously, you can read it for yourself. Um, but one thing that was interesting in this report is their uh, attempt to describe the uh, transdisciplinarity and what it means. So reading up from the, the, uh, the quote in the report, many of today's global problems are just too complex to be solved by one specialized discipline. Think of things like global warming, overpopulation, migration, and so on. Uh, these multifaceted problems require transdisciplinary solutions. While throughout the 20th century, ever graded specialization was encouraged, the next century will see transdisciplinary approaches take center stage. We are already seeing this in the emergence of new areas of study. This shift has major implications for the skill set uh, people will need to bring to organizations. And the one thing I want to bring here is that the connect transdisciplinary approaches to learning and transdisciplinary skills to new area of study. And what they imply by this is basically that transdisciplinarity is not looking at passing on knowledge, but it's uh, connected strongly to the creation of new knowledge. And I'll ask you to hang on to this. Um, uh, an approach can be deemed transdisciplinary if it aims to create new knowledge. 
Um, they go on, obviously, about talking a bit more about what transdisciplinarity means and so on. And um, one of the things that they also stress in this particular report is the extreme levels of collaboration that are going to be needed in the future in order to evolve uh, in a world that's um, uh, basically designed and collaboratively, collaboratively uh, solutions to complex problems. So these two aspects I'd like you to hold in your head. Uh, creation of new knowledge associated with transdisciplinarity and the importance of collaboration. Um, so this, this front loading basically, it's, it's a little bit uh, to say that it is, it is uh, a good thing that we do pay attention to this particular notion of transdisciplinarity and the IB is doing just that. Um, as you might know, the, um, the program is in itself in review and is due to basically produce a revised and enhanced set of documentation. And uh, through this exercise, they've been looking at these concepts of uh, transdisciplinarity and the PYP. So for your um, review, uh, there is a, a report that's been written by Brock University from Canada, and they've done basically a literature review on exploring what we say transdisciplinary learning means, uh, and they've also connected it to different models of uh, integrated curriculum. So I, would, I, I won't go over what's in that actual report. It's quite long, actually. Um, but if it's something that's interesting for you, I would strongly suggest that you look at the, um, at the report that's uh, posted on the IBO website. They have a tab uh, uh, for research, and, and that you will find the 2015 report. Um, in that, um, the author basically presents uh, things that you might be actually familiar with. You might have come across these things, but she's basically looking at um, how people have expressed continuums of integration of curriculum uh, in, in the way that's basically uh, displayed on your screen on the left side by looking at a disciplinary approach, um, going towards a multidisciplinary approach, going to interdisciplinary approach, transdisciplinary approach. Um, and just as an exercise, if you want to do this now, uh, if you're watching the recording or if you are um, uh, actually uh, live, attending this webinar live, I'll ask you to look at the four um, descriptors on the left of integration levels and look at the visuals on the right-hand side that are numbered. Um, each circle basically represents a, a discipline. Um, and maybe do some association of uh, a word with a graphic. So, um, for example, A, disciplinary, what is the graphic that could actually correspond to this approach? Um, if you're watching this uh, recorded, you can pause and maybe discuss with some of your colleagues. Um, if you're here in the visual room, I'll ask you to use the chat box to basically input um, uh, sets of letters associated with numbers. Thanks, Erin. I'm going to let Miranda input, um, but um, for the sake of time, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be uh, moving on. But uh, it is interesting to see that uh, indeed the uh, the graphic, as you have identified, Erin. Uh, two is actually corresponding to what uh, people ex describe as transdisciplinary approach uh, to integrate curriculum. Um, and that graphic in itself, um, it's this one actually. Um, what's interesting is that they're actually using an additional symbol to the circle symbols, which is basically relating to this idea of creating a new knowledge. It's something, uh, transdisciplinary learning is something that basically aims to create new knowledge. It's also um, uh, knowledge and skills that go beyond simply res rest being restricted in these circles that are um, basically representing the disciplines. Um, we still didn't get uh, Miranda's input, but it's all right. Um, let's just keep on. So here is the solution. Um, this is basically also available, I think, online. There are different people who have explored this particular continuum here uh, using these four terms. In the literature review, the author is actually looking at her own model 
uh, looking at going, going from low levels of integration, which is disciplinary, multidisciplinary, towards higher level of integration, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. Um, that's one view. This idea that it's on a continuum is one view. Not everybody thinks um, in this particular way. Uh, and I'm not going to say more, but you can read the literature review and you'll see that the author is actually explaining different approaches. Um, one that actually uh, caught my attention is one that was uh, described by Howard Gardner. And um, it's interesting because in his work with uh, Veronica Buamanzilla, uh, he's actually taking a developmental lens um, to this notion of transdisciplinarity. And he says young children go from common sense to protodisciplinary, disciplinary, and so on. Um, it's very much anchored in the, into the idea um, of developmental um, uh, approach to, to thinking and conceptual thinking. Uh, so this is an interesting, it's another model that you might be interested in. I'm not going to read through the definitions of each, sta each stage of development. Um, but it is interesting to see that um, basically uh, this common sense knowledge is the starting point. Uh, of children, because children, even as young as five or six or four, can actually consider a very broad and generative question, such as, you know, how do I keep my, my body healthy? Um, and, and such inquiries are actually um, showing that the start of this uh, development of integration of thinking and so on is actually rooted in the learner involvement, in the learner participation, in the learner input. So I like this particular take uh, because it really um, shows that uh, this development of learning is basically rooted in common sense and in and young, young children actually up until eight and nine are actually basically approaching learning in a much more holistic way than something that's divided through, through discipline. So, um, I wanted to bring this up because I wanted to stress that um, evolving towards a transdisciplinary approach cannot be done if you do not start with the learner, if you do not start where, uh, you know, how they gather their common sense knowledge, how do they make sense of it. And then from that, they actually develop what they call here protodisciplinary, uh, which is basically in the absence of strict disciplinary or subject study, students in late primary can, they can actually appreciate differences between a historical account or a literature one or a mathematical perspective on a particular um, uh, topic. Um, so this is another thing that I wanted to bring to your attention from this particular literature review because I thought it was quite relevant for uh, the approach in the PYP. Um, So uh, I'm going to maybe pause there if, if there is a question or something, or I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I'm, I'm sorry because this is, a, this is interesting actually going, going uh, through slides um, uh, being recorded because uh, I like to sometimes ask, um, you know, reflections from the audience, but maybe this actual uh, theoretical side of the presentation can actually be explored further on your own, uh, looking at the actual lit review that was published. Um, and maybe uh, do some personal studies around that or discuss with some of your colleagues. So I'd like to move into um, actually the, the, the heart of this webinar, which is basically an encouragement to uh, move away from this tension between the transdisciplinary approach and the disciplinary approach in subject teaching and learning. Um, and some of the things that uh, I would like to, to do and to encourage people to do in, in thinking about how do we step away from this constant tug of war and think about uh, uh, how we actually describe a transdisciplinary approach to learning in the PYP, is to actually look at four points. And these four points, we've actually explored them in the theory before this actual slide, but I'd like to basically put them in this format. Not that there is one more important than the other one, um, so there's no hierarchy here, but it's basically if you do nothing else after this webinar, but think about how to support a transdisciplinary approach to learning and teaching in the PYP. Um, it's to look at these four points. Uh, basically, uh, the learner participation. It's your entry point. This is where you start. You start from the 
where the learner is, their own world, their reality, the authentic context in which they evolve. And also the fourth point, we're aiming to look at the production of new knowledge. We're looking at resolving complex issues with students. Um, and when I mean complex, it's not complicated. It can be complex for a five-year-old uh, to resolve issues around uh, uh, finite resource preservation, for example, uh, and looking at the water cycle and so on. But it's basically the production of new knowledge that doesn't st sit strictly in, in, the, in the subjects and the discipline. And then throughout the learning experience, we're going to focus on um, and examine our practices and look at uh, how much integration we do and how much collaboration we do. If you, com if you remember the, uh, the report from the Phoenix Institute, uh, University of Phoenix, um, there were stressing collaboration as being uh, fundamental to a transdisciplinary approach, as well as this notion of production of new knowledge, obviously. Howard Gardner was uh, looking at uh, the learner uh, engagement, the learner involvement and participation at the entry point of the experience, but also throughout. Um, so we're going to look at moving away from this tug of war. On a, in a practical level, what is the idea given us um, uh, to organize our learning and teaching in order to do that? Um, well, you might be familiar with what of the th some of the things that the IB is giving us. Um, PYP has been very um, uh, clear in stressing the fact that the approach in its program um, must be uh, first and foremost holistic and integrated. And to that effect, they've given you uh, some tools. Um, they're here on this slide, and you might be familiar with these, obviously, uh, which is basically the transdisciplinary theme here. And they're highlighted in yellow because these are actually um, prescribed by the IB at this stage. The PYP is asking you to use these themes. Um, and there's another part of, um, uh, of the organizing framework here that the IB is giving you. It's basically concepts. In the PYP, they're key concepts. For the rest, it's basically an open canvas where instead of going from what's prescribed, the transdisciplinary themes, and trying to unpack everything to get to what is it that I'm going to be um, learning and teaching uh, at, the, at the subject level with my students, um, it's actually encouraged you, this particular canvas is encourage, encouraging you to actually go as the other way around as well. And here my little arrow in the <laughs> webinar uh, environment is actually not flipping, so I'm going to have to go backwards. Um, to basically look also at some of the, the, the subject knowledge, some of the disciplinary concepts, some of the disciplinary thinking that uh, is basically forming in the minds of young children and looking at how that informs you in the design of lines of inquiry, how that informs you in um, drafting aims for students' learning, how that informs you in choosing uh, concepts within units of inquiry. And so this symbol here, as you see, um, is not a linear process. It's basically allowing you to revisit your units of inquiry to make sure that the integration level can get higher and higher where it's relevant. Now that doesn't mean that at some point you're not looking at particular subject knowledge um, uh, and being taught uh, as standalone as we call it in the PYP, but the dynamic of this process um, of revisiting in both direction uh, the, the design of, of learning is something that can be helpful for people to consider rather than simply going in a, in a very linear way. Um, on, a, on, a, on a more anecdotal level, uh, when I looked at this, when I was a new teacher uh, and I uh, started in a PYP school and somebody presented these things to me, um, I still had a hard time figuring out, well, exactly how much math should I be putting into this particular unit? So if I have my math here, how much mathematics can I actually squeeze in there um, in order for the children to learn through this unit? Or um, you know, how much should I let them just learn the big uh, and explore the big ideas and the inquiry, hoping that somehow they're going to get to the subject knowledge? Um, and this is a tricky one because there is not an actual recipe. There's not a recipe, but at the time, I actually um, discussed with some of my colleagues uh, a metaphor that they actually shared with me. 
and I'm going to share it with you, although a metaphor is always a little bit dangerous because um, uh, my background is French language, so sometimes metaphors don't translate very well, but I'll, I'll just humor me for a minute here, and I'm going to share with you a metaphor that maybe could be useful for you. Um, uh, if you're actually an, an experienced teacher and you're trying to um, basically give a sense of people of what is it that you're supposed to do with these subjects and these units and, and so on. Uh, if you're a new teacher, this metaphor could be actually helpful for you as well. And I'm going to actually use a sweet metaphor, which is basically this idea that um, imagine this, that you're actually um, with students, with children, and uh, the idea is to make a menu make a dessert menu, and you actually get to pick one, make one, and eat one. Um, and imagine you presenting children with menu A, saying, look, this is going to be awesome. We're going to have these three items. You can choose one, uh, make one, and so on. The issue is you're looking at it, and you're like, I'm not too sure what this star fix Z-Pack tastes like. I'm not sure I want to taste number one, but I'm not sure I want to taste, I'm not sure I want to make and eat number two either because I have no idea what a spark is. And in the description, it's not really helping me more about getting a sense of what this is. And third one, not either. Imagine presenting them rather with maybe a menu B and saying, look, there are still the three same items, but um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share with you some insights into the fact that Z-Pack actually means it's cake. And we're going to explore a little bit what a cake is in terms of texture. Uh, some of the concept of what a cake is actually. Uh, and then, for example, in the description, you might want to share and explore the fact that the base taste will be chocolate. So you get a bit of an idea of what number one could be. Um, but you also explore what um, maybe the other two are. The taste of number two is coffee. Uh, in the description, we indicate that it's something that's warm. The third one is banana and uh, the texture could be creamy. So in menu B, you actually explore some base concepts. You ensure that students actually know the difference between what chocolate tastes like, what coffee tastes like, banana tastes like. Now, do you go into details about telling them what chocolate chips might be, chocolate syrup might be? You might not want to go there because you might want to let them explore and maybe make a chocolate cake you would never have thought about. So let's just go to menu C. You could also, I guess for ease, um, maybe offer them a menu C where all three items are described and not only described in the, in, in the, in the actual um, name of it, but they're also very descriptive in all the ingredients that go into it. Uh, what's probably going to happen is that, yes, children will probably be very quickly able to choose what they want to eat, what they want to make, um, but they won't have much room to explore the concept of chocolate because here it's going to be very clear that the chocolate cake is going to be served with chocolate sauce. Uh, what if we wanted to maybe do it with chocolate chips? I don't know. There's not going to be much room for students in menu C to explore and investigate. So uh, this is uh, why I wanted you to humor me <laughs> in this particular metaphor, but my colleague turned to me and, say, and said, Cecile, think of menu B. Uh, menu B has a lot of power, has a lot of, uh, uh, just a lot of potential. Um, menu A, you're going to get some students lost. You're at risk of not giving them the good basis of what, um, in this case, uh, the flavor might be. Um, but menu C might be also too constrictive and might be actually a one perspective on what a coffee cake might be or what banana pudding might be. Um, and it translates to the, to, it translated at that time to my practice and saying, I'm going to try to aim for uh, the core, um, the core subject concepts to be there, to be also explored, um, basically um, solidified in, in the children's um, uh, knowledge and skills and so on. Um, but I'm also going to leave enough room that they can actually experiment with it uh, in the context of units of inquiry. Uh, so as to what we talked about earlier, uh, maybe create new knowledge. Uh, with a menu B, I'm pretty sure you're going to have more than three items coming out of the cooking exercise. Menu C, you probably will have the three same dessert over and over again. So um, this was a metaphor that helped me at the time. Um, I still find it quite amusing in any way who can dispute uh, 
talking about dessert. Uh, <laughs> um, in, um, in the fact that um, we're sometimes struggling with um, how much, you know, how much math do I put in this unit and so on. Um, the PYP development team in The Hague, uh, working in the academic division, has been looking at how do we basically start shaping some guidance around um, uh, looking at subject, the role of subject, without saying, mm, you know, a disciplinary approach is a low level, a transdisciplinary approach is a high level. Remember, we're trying to move away from this tug of war. So this idea of moving from to moving towards was introduced in discussions with educators. Um, and uh, people started thinking about what could we do to evolve our practice when it comes to dealing with subjects in a transdisciplinary approach to learning. Um, and uh, some people said, well, I have five observations that, you know, I, I have done in my practice, and these are the things I tend to do with subjects. And maybe I can start thinking with my colleagues uh, on how to move towards a more integrated uh, way of planning, learning, and teaching. So I'm going to take you through the five different points here. There could be more, or they could be worded differently. Um, I'll just stress the fact that I'm not saying move completely away from, but I'm saying Evaluate where you are in regards to this observation, and let's talk about how we can move forward um, and towards a more integrated uh, level. So the first point here, um, it's basically an observation of practice. You might have that in your own practice or in your schools, uh, to look at subjects as collections of related facts and isolated skills. Subjects are simply facts and skills. Um, something that we could consider, and if you're actually watching this as a recording and with colleagues, I would encourage you to pause after each point here and maybe discuss how you can move from this observation in your practice and move towards something uh, that's much more integrated uh, in nature and more transdisciplinary in nature. Here I'm going to give you, uh, for the sake of time, obviously, I'm going to give you uh, some, some thoughts. N know that they're not the one single answer in this process, but they're just some thoughts. Um, if, you're, if you're finding that your practice um, aims uh, or looks at subjects as collections of uh, facts and, and skills, um, maybe you can actually expand this notion of subject to what we were calling earlier disciplinary, which is about not only the knowledge and skills, but they're also the concepts, they're also the theories, the methodologies, the ways of thinking, especially as they contribute to an understanding of how a subject connects to real life. And I think this connection to real life is very important. Uh, we discussed that earlier with uh, an explanation of, of common sense knowledge of young children. Um, it, it, it's going to be memorable if it connects to your real life. Remember what you actually shared at the beginning of this, um, of this webinar. Um, and I'd like to direct you to a, a resource on the Sharing PYP blog where a teacher actually published a blog post on uh, lessons and units in which um, she was looking at um, developing uh, skills and knowledge and understandings around uh, measurement. And in it, um, it was, it was interesting to see that students actually um, were making observations and thinking like with the mathematical thinking uh, in the realization that their life would be drastically wrong or things could go drastically wrong in their life if measurements were not taken into consideration. Uh, for example, they were talking about their houses and how could that could go really wrong and their clothes or if they were to go to market and buy vegetables and so on. Um, so, in this connection to real life and taking the learner as being um, and, and their experience in their authentic context, um, basically is something that can help you move from subjects as being uh, simply a set a, a set of uh, a set of facts and skills, but moving towards ways of thinking and connecting it to real life. Um, the second point here. Um, it's basically something that we, we sometimes observe uh, in schools. It depends how your school is actually organized. Um, that varies greatly from, I mean, there's well over a thousand PYP schools, I think at this stage maybe 1,400, and every school will handle this very differently. Uh, but in some schools we see standalone subjects as um, the sole driver for learning. Um, because time restrictions and so on. Um, th this is basically what you're having to deal with. 
but the encouragement here is to start looking at it um, basically uh, as part of the transdisciplinary learning and more and more trying to actually integrate it. Um, in this case, I would, I would start to encourage people to look at complex problems and the motivation to design solutions to this as being the driver. Uh, so maybe you're in charge of looking at uh, particular subject uh, uh, notions uh, in your school, and maybe by mandate from your state school, you might have to look at some subjects in a particular way, but as a designer of learning, as a teacher, you still have room to look at um, the driver not being the actual subject, but looking at um, the creation and the design of uh, uh, creative solutions to complex problems that students encounter. Um, and the question here to, to reflect on that for your own practice is to, to wonder, are students' interests in the community's desire to solve complex issues driving the learning in your classroom? Um, and, and this connects to the point that we made earlier to the learner participation and also the desire to create new knowledge, not just transfer knowledge from the subject, from the discipline to students, but the desire to create new, new knowledge from having learned in particular uh, context. Um, the third point uh, that we, it's actually very closely related, um, but it's, uh, it's sometimes a practice that look at teaching subject specific lessons in isolation. Um, and if you remember menu B, um, maybe at times you might have to actually look at, look, this is chocolate, this is what it tastes like, this is, you know, some of the properties. Um, if you're looking at the texture of a cake, you might want to know what's the texture of a cake and so on. Um, but in essence, the encouragement here is to start moving from um, only teaching subject-specific lessons in isolation and moving towards um, making actual connections between one subject and another and another in a way that is planned, spontaneous and incidental. And I actually like here the, the key words being, um, first of all, connections, um, but also this idea of planned, spontaneous and incidental. Uh, this is basically, it brings us back to how much collaboration is going on in your classroom. Because I can pretty much tell you that Connections are not going to happen in a spontaneous and incidental way if children and, and students are not collaborating together when they learn. Um, the same goes for connections that are being planned by you as a teacher, as designer of the learning experience for students, uh, with students. Um, it's planned when you actually collaborate with teachers. So here I'm talking about a broader sense of collaboration, which is Teachers to teachers, when you're trying to plan for these connections, students to students, when incidental ways of making connections happen, and then the spontaneous is when you as a teacher, you also look at collaborating with your, with your students, and you actually listen to them, and you actually let them explore something that comes up naturally, uh, a connection that comes up naturally in the, um, in the learning process. Um, the, um, the fourth point here is looking at um, a practice that looks at subject-specific knowledge, conceptual understandings, and skills that are viewed solely as part of the particular year level. Um, and here, um, basically, it's touching uh, on, on uh, the approach that sometimes we have to say, okay, I'm responsible for this particular year. Um, and I'm going to have to teach this thing this year for the student. How many times do we say that as teacher? Oh, this year I have to do this. Or I'm changing grade levels and I'm going to have to do all this because it belongs to this grade level. Um, I'd like to encourage you to start breaking that pattern of thought um, and start thinking of knowledge, conceptual understanding, developing over time. So here the key word being um, over time. Uh, and how do you do that? You have to assess prior knowledge and you have to know the needs of students before even you select or you plan connections and specific conceptual understanding and knowledge and skills uh, in units of inquiry. Without knowing that, you might not know where to take each individual child um, to their next step in their knowledge um, and in, le in their learning. learning. Um, so here, <coughs> uh, we're connecting back to this notion of learner participation. 
right? If you do not assess prior knowledge, um, chances are you're going to just deliver a curriculum that's basically, yeah, it belongs to your grade level, so you're going to do it, that's your job. But basically, uh, looking at the development of children over time within your school is something that you're going to have to do if you want to aim to be more integrated because um, this, de this, this uh, development over time, it, the knowledge and the skills and the conceptual understanding will get refined with um, its use in authentic learning situations. So again, connecting to authentic learning situations for students means you need to focus on learner participation in your activities, in your planning, and in assessing a knowledge understanding within units of inquiry, not just in particular year level. The other part here also that's important, so I've connected this particular point to the learner participation that we discussed earlier, but also um, it relates to collaboration. Um, obviously collaboration not just between people who are dealing with a particular year, year group um, in their school, but also across the whole school between the grades. Um, and the last, um, the last point that I wanted to, um, to basically uh, discuss was um, a practice that uh, aims to measure students' abilities within a subject only. Um, and that we see a lot of, um, I've been, um, uh, guilty as well, um, to uh, feel very confident that students are learning because basically, you know, once you've assessed their mathematical um, knowledge uh, and their reading abilities or science uh, facts um, and so on, you're, you're feeling confident that basically students are learning something in the classroom. Um, but the move forward is to actually look uh, start looking at monitoring, documenting, and measuring students' capacity to understand and apply subject-specific conceptual understandings, knowledge, skills within these authentic contexts. So again, here, um, it's um, the key words here being um, authentic context. So again, bringing it back to uh, the learner input, participation, connection, but also looking at our practice in assessment. And here the three keywords are monitoring, documenting, and, mu and measuring. Um, this basically requires a certain level of collaboration, both between teachers and students, but also between teachers and teachers. Because if you're going to document something that students are learning over time, you might want to be um, able to discuss that with other adults that are involved in this particular student's life. So, um, and not just confine uh, the assessment to a particular subject in a particular year uh, year level. So these are some ideas, and I'm sure um, if you're actually watching um, um, if you're actually watching this as a recording, um, I, I think it's important to maybe stop and even think: Are there other practices that we might want as a learning community that we might want to move from? and uh, some things that we might want to move forward. And I'm actually, I apologize, I didn't really keep up with the actual um, chat, but I'm seeing that there are a few comments there. Uh, a comment on collaboration with Erin. Um, um, this is an, it, it's an interesting one uh, in terms of uh, subject um, teachers. And this is to do probably more with, with the, um, uh, the standards and practices in terms of uh, some of the requirements there. Um, and I believe, and don't um, don't write this black on white because uh, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe the IB is currently evolving its standard and practices um, to be more flexible in this approach. Uh, but regardless, who is, you know, what teacher is in charge of what in the school, I think, like you say, uh, collaboration here is key. I don't think that you can imagine to use a transdisciplinary learning um, uh, framework uh, and not have a high degree of collaboration. Um, and the collaboration aims for one thing. The collaboration doesn't aim for teachers to be the superhero of transdisciplinary learning. The collaboration aims for the learning experience of students to be transdisciplinary. Again, I'll ask to shift from being so preoccupied by the role of the teacher and also shift to the role of the students and the input of the students and the connection to students' life 
And I think this is what the collaboration should also aim to. Um, not so much be preoccupied by, you know, what's my part of the, what's my part of the cake here to go back to dessert. Um, Miranda also says, um, basically, it's, there's an exciting, um, an exciting prospect here. If we're starting to encourage ourselves first, always start with yourselves, but also your colleagues to move beyond year level knowledge, conceptual understanding and skills. It is a big shift. It depends, that depends very strictly on, on the, uh, how your school is organized. Um, and how much collaborative planning time you actually receive as a school. Um, but I think there is a lot of potential there. The more you increase level of collaboration with other year group teachers, I think um, uh, the more potential you have to, to offer a transdisciplinary learning experience to students. Um, and then moving from ownership of students by specific teachers, yes, it's that, that, would be a, a, that would be a very good one to add in the left column. Miranda, thank you for the input. We could actually see that um, uh, practice um, in school sometimes tend to look at groups of students belonging to a particular teacher. And I like the comment you made, Miranda, because this is actually bringing me to my next slide, which is um, basically trying to wrap up a little bit this, this webinar content. It's looking at you know the top here. This is what we've been concerned a lot over the last 10 years, you know, in the PYP is how we organize teaching and learning. And uh, the shift that we're asking um, basically people to do in our communities, in our schools, is to start looking at uh, transdisciplinary learning. It's not just about the organization of teaching and learning. It is a work in progress. Let's just put it that way. And there are some tools that the IB has given us to do that. But it is our responsibility as educators to actually move from solely being concerned from this teaching and learning um, organization to what's the impact of the learner and what's the input from the learner that we're actually basing our whole teaching and learning on. And the other people uh, that are involved too in order to make this whole experience transdisciplinary for students is the learning community. What is what is the responsibility of the learning community to support learning and teaching in, in the PYP? Uh, and this touches on the, the collaboration that is, that is important. So uh, instead of now starting to try to explain transdisciplinary learning in the PYP by some sort of formula of how much subject you put into your lessons or units, uh, let's talk about these two things there, these two wheels, um, looking at uh, how much is the learner involved, how much is the learner considered, how much is the learner engaged, and uh, how much is the learning community as well supporting that in, in, in the planning um, uh, and in their interaction and collaboration with, uh, uh, with each other, members with each other. And this includes the families as well. Uh, if you have a chance to um, consider the learning community being inclusive of families, I think you have even more potential to go beyond the disciplinary walls of, uh, and the subject walls of learning in a classroom, but you open it up to uh, these children's real world because their families is their first uh, real world, uh, especially the younger, the younger they are. Um, but that doesn't go away for teenagers. Um, some of you might know. <laughs> um, so I'd like to, to basically wrap up um, this webinar now because I'm being conscious of the, the time. Uh, at the beginning of the presentation, there is my um, email address. Uh, you're feel free to contact me um, if you have additional questions. Uh, this recording will be available in case you've missed some of the um, some of the uh, references that were made. I will strongly encourage you to actually go to sharing the PYP blog because uh, the team that's behind the blog is actually. Uh, collaborating with educators all over the world uh, to produce articles, snapshots in practice that are basically um, looking at this particular um, uh, construct in, in the program and looking at transdisciplinary learning as well. So I wanted to thank you for, for attending today uh, and hopefully I've uh, given you some thoughts. Uh, this was the aim was to get some support thoughts and also um, looking at uh, three things that we can start doing uh, as I was explaining earlier, to shift from looking at the teacher organization side of things to the learner experience. That's one thing that we can start doing. 
uh, to focus on the responsibility of the learning collab uh, community to collaborate in order to provide learners with this particular experience we're seeking to organize. And then um, to care for, obviously, this is something we've done, to, this is the last point, to care for aspects of learning and teaching that need to evolve, um, such as the exercise we did uh, using the table in previous slides. So thanks, thanks again uh, for uh, taking part in this webinar. And I'll see you either online or in real life at some point. Thank you very much, Cecil. Thank you.